And this is BBC Two, continuing Victorian week with their inventive side. The surprising side of the Victorians. from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. 2001 marks the 100th anniversary of the death of Queen Victoria, and we're here to celebrate the incredible achievements of the Victorian age, which gave us everything from the electric light bulb to the petrol-driven car. Throughout the programme, we'll be meeting experts, collectors and enthusiasts with their Victorian objects and inventions. It's incredible to think how much of what the Victorians created lives on to this day and has shaped our modern world. That's fantastic. And I've got my first Victorian enthusiast. You seem to have a football here. Is that something special? Uh, yes, this is uh, a Victorian football, uh, circa uh, approximately 1888, which was the first season of the Football League. And this was the uh, ball now that was being used um, as a regulated size for all major games. Wow, that's amazing. The Black Dyke Mills Band, who played us in, owe their origins to the Victorians. And with me are Jeff Whiteley and Nicholas Childs. Welcome, gentlemen. Oh. Jeff, how did the band start? When did it start? It started in September 1855. Right. John Foster, the mill owner in the village, started the band off, and uh, bought the valve instruments as they were, mm. and uh, to get the community involved in music and to perform high-class music, which it had done ever since 1855. And Nick, uh, what is that instrument? And were instruments then, 150 years ago, very different to what we would see today in the band? Well, this is the euphonium, and, and indeed, no, uh, the instruments would have been extremely similar. But of course, it was the Victorians that invented the valves. Uh, with the valves, uh, it allowed brass players to play every note of the scale. So for the very first time, they could compete musically with the woodwind and string instruments. So not a great deal of change to do. This is an apple peeler. We'll have to try it out. Let's see what happens. Come on, work, please. Oh, that's that is amazing. <laughs> that was so quick, wasn't it? I could do some more of those apples for my apple pie later on, then, can't I? Yeah, that's wonderful. That's absolutely. a wonderful thing. And um, um, what what's that we've got here? This is the spice box. In the early part of the Victorian reign, reign when uh, spices were more valuable, they would have been a padlock on it. The head of the household would kept the key so that the spices were you know, locked up mm -hmm. and safe. Inside, six spices. This one has its own grater. Inside, nutmegs. That is brilliant. I can use that later on. Yeah. Spices yeah. were very, very popular, though, weren't they, in the Victorian times? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm actually making this mulligatoni soup at the moment, and I've got a pan here that's cooking away. And um, obviously, the spices that go into that were things like curry powder. And the curry powder obviously was imported, the almonds, and also mango juice. So I'm just going to put in this powder that will give it this natural mulligatoni flavor, which again, which is basically like a curry soup. So I'm just going to pop this back onto the, the fire. Let it burn away there. And what's that leg of mutton? Just cook away. But remember, they used to do everything on the on this range. They'd cook, boil, bake, steam, griddle. But I must get on. I've got to finish this New Year's Day's lunch, and uh, I'll see you all later. These days, people talk about the commercialization of Christmas, but most of the customs which surround our present-day festivities stem from Victorian times. And Paul Atterbury, hello, you've kindly agreed to be with us um, throughout the programme. Tell us about Christmas. Well, it started really with the Victorians. You've got to imagine that although there were celebrations about the end of the year, there was no presents, there was no turkey, there was no tree, no decorations. 
No celebration as we know it today. It all came in in the Victorian period. And why? Why did they invent what we know today? Well, really, it was about their concern about family values. They wanted something which could be a family celebration. Everybody was brought together, present giving was instigated. And above all else, Prince Albert brought in the decorative tree in 1843. Mm. The decorations initially were quite simple. They were candles, they were little baskets of fruit and sweetmeats. But of course, eventually, by the 1860s, you're certainly getting the glass baubles that we know so well today. Right. And uh, I understand that Robert here has something to show us. Ah, in the yes. box. Yes. Let's have a look. What, what have you got there? Oh, look. This was a very old bauble that was, that's been in my family since my great-grandmother's. Gosh, that's, that's a very, that's, that's, a, that's right at the beginning of baubles. But interesting, it doesn't look very different, does it, to the sort of baubles that we have today? Not very much. It no. feels heavier. Have a, have a feel. Oh, yes, it's made of glass. It's though. made of glass. They're made of blown glass, blown into moulds in exotic shapes. Mostly made in South Germany, but obviously in other glass centres as well. Right. And what you say is quite right. We are looking at something which we could have hung on our tree mm. now. The Christmas card was also a Victorian invention, and here we have the very first card. Now, Suzanne Fagens Cooper, you're going to be sharing your expert knowledge with us today, along with Paul. Um, tell us first of all about this card. It was designed in 1843 for Henry Cole, who was the first director of the V&A Museum. And it shows some of the things that the Victorians thought were special about Christmas. There's a family sitting down at a table in the middle. But on either side, there are scenes of charity as well, which they thought were very important at Christmas time. Right. And Beryl, what exactly is all this about? This is an album belonging to a young Victorian girl, started in 1882. And these are Christmas postcards, although they don't reflect Christmas as we know no, these days. No, they're not days. the classic. They're no, definitely not. And Let's this is one of my favourite pages. It is more typical of Christmas these days, as it shows uh, children uh, sliding on the ice and tobogganing, um, but also other aspects of, of Christmas here. Yes, these are children who are working. There's a little violet cellar and a chestnut roaster. And it reminds us much more of the Dickensian sort of Christmas yes. that we read about in yes. The Christmas Carol. And how about these cards here, Suzanne? Um, what are these? Well, they show us the development of the Christmas card from something which is rather like a calling card. It's very simple. And gradually, during the course of the century, they developed little lift-up flaps, something a bit more elaborate. And uh, I love this, with the bulldog <laughs> yeah, that's wagging great. his head. But by the end of the century, they were developing these amazing that's cards. Beautiful. This one's got stained glass in the background and it is absolutely extraordinary, I think. Christmas crackers, are you telling me they were Victorian as well? Absolutely. Tom Smith, the great cracker name, invented in 1846 and patented a year later the thing that goes snap. Before that they had parcels that you pulled apart and gifts fell out, but it was the bang and the crack that of course made it a Christmas a cracker. cracker. So are these Victorian, really? Yes, and these are late Victorian, 1900, the end of the century. And here you see, in effect, the modern cracker. And I like the images of Father Christmas, Santa Claus. Of course, he was a late Victorian addition. He yes. didn't really occur until the 1870s, 80s. Yes. But here he is on the crackers. On all the crackers. And this, of course, is a lovely one again. Here you've got the pretty girl, again, a very typical yeah. Christmas yeah. image. But what was in the cracker, of course, was like now there was a novelty of some kind. And there was, of course, also the paper hat. And here we have a wonderful <laughs> fishy oh, that's paper really hat, nice. um, which you would open up and put on. And you so, don't get them like that these days, do you? No, no, this is a sort of, this is a hat on its own class. Yeah, it's terrific. Class. Oh, it's quite hard work, that lovely, an original Victorian street barrel piano. Do you recognise the tune or indeed the chorus, all the nice girls love a sailor. It's true, you know. It's also true that no Victorian Christmas was complete without music, inside or outside the home. Indeed, throughout the year, gathering round a piano or a music box was a popular form of family entertainment. Ginny, you brought along this lovely box. Could you tell me a bit about its history? Yes, it's a musical box, and it was bought for my great-aunt by her husband to keep her company in the evenings when he was out. Mm -hmm. And it plays ten tunes. Do you like me to play it? Yes. Just a little bit. And this bit comes up too. Yes. And you can alter the tone to a harp. <laughs> it's not so pleasant, no, though, is not, it? No, that's much prettier. Yes. Mm. 
It's actually quite relaxing, isn't it, listening to... Mm. It is. Listening it is. to those musical boxes. And, and Michael, how, how do they actually work? Well, they were driven by a clockwork motor, which turned this uh, barrel on which the little pins had been put in, and those caught the tuned comb that actually pr produced the tunes. And this box here uses a flat disc, which like is a, a record player. They're just like a record player, much cheaper to produce, and you could change these discs and collect them with all the popular songs of the day. And so you could literally buy different different uh, records for indeed, it. Indeed, you could build up quite large collections, unlike the cylinder box where the tunes were fixed when you bought the box. It was very difficult to put new tunes onto them. This you could build up substantial collections of music, as you would do with LPs and CDs and so on. So, Margaret, you've brought along your collection of sheet music. That's right. Are there particular favourites among them? Yes, I think the ones that show the social history of the time, like this one, the, the father going out shopping. Oh, yes, because the Lowther Arcade is where everyone went to get their Christmas toys, That's isn't it? That's right, yes. And the piano was really a heart of, of family life in the 19th century. And what they used to do is, you know, these things would be sung on the music hall stage, and then people would rush out and buy the latest hits, like, like going out to buy That's the latest right. CD, take them home and start bashing away on the piano and singing along to them. Unfortunately, sheet music isn't much good to me because I can't play the piano or indeed anything else much. What I really need is one of these. This is one of those things you push up to the piano and it plays the piano for you. And luckily, Michael Broadway here knows how to operate it. Now, this is, I believe, a pianola. Is yes, that right? a push-up pianola with 65 fingers sticking out of the back, one for each note of almost all the notes of the I'm piano. I'm just going to push them down like my fingers would. It would do, yes. And it operates off a paper roll of tape. Yes, yes the paper rolls have holes punched into them, all the right notes in the right order. So could you show me what I could do if I had one of these? I'll have a go. This is the Eton Boating Song. Oh, good. I like that. Can I say, <laughs> or perhaps I better not say. <laughs> a lovely collection you've got here. See, this is a very early Edison phonograph. That's the beginning of the well, that's right. recorded it, era? It started in 1878 when he actually got this thing viable to record and reproduce the sound, speech mainly. It revolutionized the uh, domestic entertainment market. Not intentionally, because initially it was uh, intended as an office machine. Mm -hmm. Then it progressed to the Berliner, um, or the gramophone, which um, uh, designed in 1888 and became very popular right into the 1890s and challenged the phonograph and finally killed it in 1905. While we're enjoying the wonderful world of music, Lucinda is about to delve into more down-to-earth matters at Beamish Museum. During the 19th century, Britain ruled the sanitary waves. From the chamber pot to the peerless beauties of the ceramic pans, improvements marched unabashedly ahead. Simon Kirby is here, who's a great hero in the sanitary world, as he has just saved and resurrected the grand old Victorian firm of Thomas Crapper. And having bashed your eye on one of the bowls, what happened? That's right, yes, uh, bringing uh, all these lavatories to, for you to see today, <laughs> loading it up in the car, I managed to headbutt. Well, you've got one a nice black eye to so, prove it. Yes. This one is earlier, of course. Yes, this is, um, this is a, a Reverend Henry Mole uh, earth closet. Uh, the Reverend Mole uh, believed that water closets were a waste not only of God's water, but also of God's nutrients. So he built this patented earth closet, which is a large seat with a hole in the top and a bucket underneath. But the patented part was this hopper, which you filled with dry earth. And when you'd finished what you'd come to do, you'd pull the handle forward and a few handfuls <laughs> of earth would go over what you'd left in the bucket. I'd love to know about this stuff here, because this is really gleaming too. Well, this is an example of the, the early wash-out closet. This was made by Dalton & Co. before they were Royal Dalton. In those days, you had a large, shallow shelf and uh, the water, when you pulled the chain, would come rushing down and wash everything off the shelf yeah. and down the hole at the front. Um, this one is, um, is a closet of the century, uh, beautifully decorated, and 
uh, made by George Jennings <gasps> of London. Who, of course, was responsible for the first public laboratories. That's right. In the world, at the Great Exhibition with his monkey closets. He, of course, ended up uh, causing the, the expression to spend a penny. Indeed. Uh, was that at the Great Exhibition? That was at the Great Exhibition. Right. Uh, right. First of all, you paid an attendant a penny to use the, the loo. Um, later on, he invented the penny in the slot, I believe. Oh, really? He hmm? did that? I I didn't know. Then this is an example of uh, the first one-piece pedestal loo. Uh, Thomas William Twyford. Um, in 1880, invented the unitas, and he cast it all in one piece, and by 1883, it was all in a pedestal like that. It was Twyford, I believe, who, when testing one of his bowls, in his overexcitement at the flush, snatched a cap off a workman's head nearby and threw it into the bowl, trying to get, works, huzzah! When the flush was taken, took away the cap, is that right? I think that was it. Well, actually, it was ascribed to Crapper as well and John Shanks. All of them did. It's Shanks, it was Shanks. Shanks. Yes, it was, oh, you think You're Shanks right. is not, yeah, I think Shanks. They're great heroes and they're interchangeable yes. heroes. That's and right. you join their number now, which is very good. <laughs> Too kind. <laughs> this is coming on fine. I'm just basting it with these lovely juices. But now I need to get on with my vegetables, and I've got some lovely selection of vegetables. But what on earth is that? This is a, a Victorian vegetable cutter, a mixer, as you can see. It cuts the veggies and mixes them at the same time. That's it's wonderful. Like an old beam engine based on ratchets and gears. Right, shall we play? Yeah, go on, let's Thanks. see if we can get the thing going. Just put a... As you see, we're doing some of that. Some, some, we'll some carrots into it. That should... Oh, it does work. It does work. But I think I'll stick to the old knife. I think. <laughs> but a, a nice invention. Very nice invention indeed, isn't it? That looks an interesting book. I've never heard of Cotillene before. Where, where did you come by that booklet? This is a booklet of printed recipes that was sent through the post to my great-great-aunt, who was a lady who ran a confectioner's shop in Levenshulme in Manchester. It was a vegetable substitute for butter and lard, and the idea was that you used cotyline in all your old recipes, but you could use a third less than margarine or lard. Also being a vegetable substitute, um, far advanced for their time, obviously there were vegetarians around at that time as well, so yes. I think that's really interesting, isn't it? Yes. Nothing yeah. new, is there? No, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> right, I could do with a pastry cutter now. Yeah, try this one. Try. Looks like a plough, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> It's solid brass, this. It's very heavy, you know. Oh, look at this. Just look at that. <laughs> and they used to uh, make really nice patterns with things like this. this. This is wonderful, actually. But they also used to make different decorations. And what they'd do, they'd put different types of decorations on top of the pies so that when they were in the larder, and because it was dark, they had to feel. So the ones that had leaves on it and, and decorations on it was the sweet. And the ones that were plain was the savoury. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. We'll put two cherries in here. Place like that. We put the levers over. The arms come down, take Lovely. the stones well out, and then brings back. The cherries get pulled off straight into the bowl. Beautiful. You have an automatic cherry stone. I have an automatic lemon squeezer, as you can see. And with a bit of luck, we can be able to turn it, as with the automatic gears, and there the juice pours out. Look at that. Very effective. Have you seen anything as wonderful as that? Right, let's uh, bang this in the oven. The lamb's done. The lamb is looking lovely. So I think it's just a matter now of the soup's ready. I've set in this lovely table now, getting this table and get the centrepiece ready, so that we can show you a full selection of the lovely food that they have in the Victorian times. I've always been fascinated by communication. During the Victorian age, it became much easier to get in touch with other people than your next door neighbors, and the main instrument was the electric telegraph. Now, Neil Johannesson, you brought along some fantastic stuff from the BT Museum. Tell me about it. Well, the pieces that are behind are needle telegraphs. The very first electric telegraphs were in 1837, just when Queen Victoria came to the throne. With and needles? Yes. The needle works quite simply. It's, it's really just a matter of if the needle goes to the left or to the right, and by using those as codes, you can actually read off a letter. So if you look at the top left on the right. left-hand needle, a here. two dashes, two turns to the left is an A. 
three turns to the left is a B. Ah, Simple. So somebody sat at one end with one of these and somebody at the other end with another one and you turned these, need, need, these handles. Yes, indeed. And as you can see from the front of this, it was also very much useful for the railways. In fact, oh, it was yes. crucial to the railways right. because unless you could send a message along the railway to get bef there before the train, you had problems in terms of timetabling and signalling and all those sorts well, of things. Well, particularly if you had only one line, you'd never know if there were two trains. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, so it was actually problem. crucial for safety. But now, then once you've got that, you can open it up. This is, it looks like the same thing, but it's a bit, but sort of bigger and grander. This is very much more grand. This is a telegraph which was used on the line to Buckingham Palace. You mean Queen Victoria came down and actually operated the levers? I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. But her messages from the throne, her messages to her nation and to her empire, could well have come through this machine. You mean the Christmas broadcast came? Could well have done, yes. Oh, that's yes. fantastic. Yeah. Now, this looks a whole lot more complicated. The, the machine is very much more complicated, but it's very much easier to use. And, and that was really important, because as you start to open up the telegraph network, put it all over the country, you get people who perhaps only deal with one message a week, perhaps one message a day. They can't be trained, they can't have any skill, so you want a very easy machine. And this is called the alphabetic telegraph, the ABC. So you move the needle around to the left you want to send? You do, yeah. And, and then press the key, is that right? No, you press the key, and keep winding and you literally spell the message out by pushing the keys as you're winding. Can we do one? We can indeed. Okay, yep. so where's the receiving end? The receiving end is... Hundreds on, of miles away. Oh, well, it could be not quite a hundred miles I'll, away. I'll go a hundred miles away and, and watch. Now, what, what do I have to do? Just note what letters they are. Well, you just literally watch where your needle stops. N. O. No turkey. No N-O-E. Noel! Christmas! Happy Christmas! Oh, fantastic! Ah! Simple as that. That's terrific. That's really nice machine. Excellent. Can I have one of these? Uh, well, I don't know that it would be much use to you. You'd be better with the internet nowadays. Well, I, ah, oh well. So this is essentially, this is the internet of the 1890s. Indeed it is, yeah. Now tell me about this book. I recently bought this book from a shop and it was printed in 1897 to commemorate the Diamond Jubilee. So it's a sort of survey of the 60 years of Queen Victoria's yes, reign? Yes, it is. It Anything out. caught your eye particularly? Uh, particularly this page here where it gives um, some pictures of telegram machines and telegraph machines. Oh, yes. And the one shown here was used to help apprehend a murderer travelling from Crewe, I believe. I'll read what it says here. On January the 1st, 1844, the following message was received from Slough on this instrument shown here. A murder has just been committed at Salt Hill and the suspected murderer was seen to take a first-class ticket for London by the train which left Slough at 7.42 p.m. He is in the garb of a Quaker. <laughs> and so the telegraph message was sent to Paddington. It was. And when the train arrived, the police were standing on the platform mm -hmm. and they were able to arrest him. They were. I must admit, they, they, they wouldn't have had any difficulty in picking him out. No, that's it? right. But it does show how, what a radical change this, mis that's this right. machine brought Absolutely. to our lives. Yes, definitely. Fascinating. I'm the great, great grandson of John Pender, the founder of the cable companies. His grand design was to put a cable across the Atlantic, which he achieved uh, eventually in 1866. And uh, this rather fine uh, etching uh, was the Great Eastern, which uh, carried finally the successful cable. So this, this is a sample of the cable that the Great Eastern, Eastern laid and that, linked? That, that, that's a perfect example of it. Good. So that, that was laid all the way across the Atlantic between yes. Europe and America? I mean, a, a really prodigious feat all those years ago. Other methods of communicating also took off during the reign of Queen Victoria. The postal service. In 1840, the universal penny postage, the penny black, became the world's first adhesive postage stamp. These are family letters found in a box in the attic. So this is, what, 1837? 1837, right. right. Let's open it up. Right. Now, what have we got? Well, we've got this side written by the husband, mm. who was my second, third cousin, and the, once several times removed, and this is by his wife, um, oh, and obviously she ran out of space, well, she I had would a lot say. To say, perhaps. Well, yes. Um, but, so she's gone normally along the line. Yes. She's then gone vertically. Yes. And on these crossed letters, as they were mm. called, sometimes they even went horizontally, or right, not horizontally, right. diagonally. They must be absolutely impenetrable. I mean, how on earth do you read it? Well, with, with great difficulty. I did actually, was able to read this, and but what, only with a magnifying glass and a very strong and light. what's all this about? 
It, it's basically about the problems they're having with their governors. Mm -hmm. And the first half, which goes almost down to there, is about how difficult it is to write this letter because she can't see by candlelight and her eyes aren't very good. And she's going to be brief. And I, then I she's going to be brief. Yes, for yes. Say no more. <laughs> so that's what happened. And of course, why did they do it? Well, they did it because mm. letters were then charged by piece of paper. Oh, right. And so every piece of paper added to the cost. Yeah. That's why there's no envelope. Oh, so you used right. absolutely everything and you made an envelope by folding up the letter right. itself. So Avis, why would a postmistress have one of these scales on her counter? Well, this is the point at which payment for a letter went from payment by page right. to payment by weight. And it has the postal rates engraved on it. So. If you had a letter that weighed up to an ounce, then it would just be a penny. Just one penny. But up okay. to four ounces, then you'd have to get a tuppenny blue stamp. Oh, that's right. Why do you collect letter boxes? I'm trying to show the evolution of door furniture over the last 300 years. All kinds of door furniture and letter boxes are very important. It's part of that story. Why is that? Why is that for? Well, until we had the penny post, we didn't need letter boxes because you pay the, the receiver paid. Therefore, you knocked on the door and you handed over the letter. Once a payment was made at the beginning, then all the postman simply came and had to put it through a slot. And if there was no slot, the slot had to be made. And so you get the evolution of the letterbox. This one's probably the oldest. This is about 1840 to 45 from a cottage outside Dorking. Risk of that back in 1970. Handmade bolts. You can date them by this early spring mechanism long since rusted away. Right. And this is a combined knocker and... Yes, letterbox. from Avenue Terrace, Woodbridge Road, Guildford. Rescue that back in 66. <laughs> how can you remember <laughs> details like that, Charles? It's passion of mine, but it's quite interesting. Really? That. And how many have you got? Oh, about three or four hundred, I suppose. And you remember <laughs> every one? <laughs> well, I'm very impressed. But what about this, this one, then? That's a commercial one from Reading, Blaygrave Street, I suppose about 1890. Lovely <laughs> Kenrick one, Archibald Kenrick of West Bromwich. <gasps> Incredible. Lovely movement on that. And now reproduced, actually, that and one. And bigger, because, of course, companies had bigger letters. Of course. Well, I mean, clearly, this changed the face of front doors forever, really, didn't it? It did, very much so. The post office have always been great experimenters with various forms of transport. They first delivered mail by bicycle in 1880 in Coventry. This is a Rover 1885 safety bicycle, but the bicycle generally was a huge hit in Victorian times because not only did it allow people to travel much further than they'd ever been before, but it liberated women from the tighter forms of corset. And later, in 1886, the internal combustion engine gave birth to the petrol-driven car. Manufacturing companies like Daimler, Benz and Peugeot were to become household names. Only a few wealthy Victorians could own a car, but a lot of people could embrace the freedom provided by public transport. Blessings on France and her handmade sea. They make utopia seem only half a dream. So wrote a poet on the triumph of the railway train, that most tremendous of technological developments of the 19th century. Indeed, the whole face of Victoria's England was changed by those iron veins that coursed throughout the land. This engine here is of particular splendour, and Jim Rees, I want to know more. This is locomotion. This is the engine that started passengers on railways. The earlier ones had puffed about pulling coal here in the northeast, and this engine opened the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1825, the first steam haul passenger railway. So this chuffed its way from Georgian England into Victoria. Oh, England. beautifully put! <laughs> With its funny noise. Absolutely beautiful. Oh, so, yeah, fantastic. Off we go. Oh, let me help you. There you go. Mm, look at these excitements. Okay, let's see what we've got. Bye. Hello. How do you do? Hello. I'd love to hear all the things you've got here. Look at them all. Wow. Uh, well, the first one, this one, is a particularly good example of a railway watch. Now, up to the time of uh, the railways coming, uh, a different time was uh, in use in various parts of the country. There was no such thing as standardised time. No idea. And the railways um, uh, introduced 
uh, the, or forced the adoption of um, Greenwich Mean Time as a standard time throughout really? the country. Really? And the time, in effect, would come down by the guard on a train and this would be a watch by which uh, the time was then, he would show this to the station master and the station master would adjust his uh, station clock. That's very magical to be uh, the bringer of time. It's, um, it's a particularly good example this because the face is very clear uh, uh, with, with Midland uh, on there. Got a Midland um, railway locomotive. Oh, isn't that lovely? Steam isn't whistle, which is fairly heavy, solid brass. What a lovely thing that is. Do you think polished. people would like railway engines more today if they still had these on? <laughs> See if you can get a noise out of it. We're going to hit something. <laughs> no, no. No. Try, try blowing that one. Try blowing that one. Try blowing that one. Blow. <whistles> That's, That's it. it. Great Western Railway. <laughs> this is a collection of the hair of the Brunel family. Wow. Made into a flower pattern. Oh, so beautiful. And uh, the hair that is standing proud over the rest of the hair. That is Isambard Kingdom Brunel. So this is the hair of the child who transformed so much of England with his viaducts and with his bridges and with his railways and with his tunnels yep. and all the extraordinary, extraordinary things that he did. That's right. And then his sister Sophia is, is here. She was my great, great, great grandmother. Oh, marvelous. So you are the great, great, great nephew of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. That's very exciting. Um, what a beautiful object. Margaret, where did you get this lovely book from? Well, I acquired it because it was, uh, I think, my great grandmother's. Yeah. It came to me when my grandmother died. And uh, it explains a little about Victoria's reign. But this particular yeah. chapter is about locomotion and about the various... Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. ways that were developing. Had you read this bit? Yes, the proposed channel tunnel. It had yes. even gone Wonderful. so far. Um, they'd actually made a start. Yes, they yes, made a start. Yes, they did make a start. Which was quite interesting. Yeah, <laughs> the amount of times the channel tunnel from Napoleonic times onwards has been a serious suggestion. Yes. And several attempts to get going, and then, of course, we've finally seen it a hundred years later. That's right. Amazing. These are all handbills for Thomas Cook's Cheap excursions. Oh, so they are cooks. Are they? they are cooks tours, early cooks tours. Thomas Cook was a man who had an idea um, that changed the world. Uh, he was a temperance supporter and he wanted to use these new trains um, to promote the cause of temperance. That's how it all began. Isn't that delightful detail? It is. Um, 